welcome to an Actors Life This Series Rewind. I'm your host, creator and executive producer, Michelle Baldwin, and I am so ecstatic to bring to you today another Voting Summit series. Today, we're talking with the men. We're hearing their thoughts, their concerns, their issues, and why it's so important for us all to go out and vote. It is our civic responsibility and every vote counts. So with nine more days left to go to the craziest election I've seen in my lifetime, it is so important to get yourselves out to vote. And if you haven't voted, there's early voting, mail-in voting, and there's drop-off box ballot voting. But make sure, please make sure that it is an official box and not one of the phony GOP boxes that have been popping up. They are actually illegal. And we want a fair, square election this 2020. Hi, I'm Benjamin K. Thomas. I am host and producer of Actors Life, the series Rewind. And today we are turning the show over to these handsome men. They are going to tell us why we need to go out and vote on November 3rd. Take it away, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what's happening, everybody? Uh, thank you, ladies, uh, for uh, letting us <laughs> take over this show uh, one more game. My name is uh, Warner Miller, and I will be one of the uh, uh, distinguished guest host on this uh, episode of An Actor's Life, uh, An Actor's Life, the series Rewind Mo uh, Men's Voting Summit. And uh, thankfully, I don't have to uh, handle this thing by myself. I have uh, some some brilliant men um, uh, uh, doing most of the heavy work, if I could be honest. Uh, uh, Brandon, please uh, introduce yourself, brother. Brandon Bryce, uh, host of Straight Talk on 9, 10 a.m., Superstation, uh, Future, the, Pri the Price is Right on podcasts, uh, real news, real people, straight to the point. Right on. Uh, David, if you will. Uh, David Deblinger. I'm an actor, writer, um, director, producer, teacher, facilitator. And I, I, uh, I have a new podcast uh, uh, episode that I wrote and perform out that's coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, that I'm excited about too, but I'm really excited to be here uh, with all of you today. Thank you, David. And our uh, guest correspondent uh, helping us out, uh, Mr. Gil Tucker, please. Uh, you uh, like like uh, Warren has said, my name is Gil Tucker. Um, I'm an actor, comedian, uh, producer, but uh, I'm just thrilled to be here in this situation with you brothers and, and, and to discuss, uh, you know, people getting out to vote. And as guest correspondent, um, I just want to let everybody know, if you have any questions, just put it in the chat and I will do my best to make sure that I bring it to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you to everyone who's listening. And again, thank you to the to the women, uh, Michelle, T. Renee and Benja for uh, allowing us uh, this time to chop it up. Um, like I said, we are, are discussing uh, voting and with voting comes with it uh, politics. And uh, we are going to be doing something that, in my opinion, doesn't happen enough. We're going to be chopping it up. We're, go we're going to be talking uh, to each other. We're going to be um, having a conversation um, civilly. Uh, we don't all uh, agree uh, on, on everything, nor should we, because um, that wouldn't be the American way. But, uh, but, but we are going to do our best to present um, uh, uh, an informed, um, understandable, uh, perspective uh, to, to give the reason why we believe what we believe with regard to our uh, positions. Um, so again, in, in full transparency, um, I will kind of give you a bit of my, uh, or at least some of my background. So uh, again, my name is Warner. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm an actor. Uh, I'm a father of a six month old or about to be six month old. Uh, I am a husband and um, I am a, a political novice uh, with regard to my understanding, not with regard to voting, which again, if I can't, I can't emphasize this enough, um, full transparency, our agenda is to get you to vote, is to get you to vote. Um, whoever you vote for, that's your business, um, but we, we want you to vote um, because um, your vote is a, is a voice and it is an important voice and uh, that needs to be heard. Um, so with that, um, we uh, 
<laughs> we actually had a great discussion. I wish you could have heard it. We had our kind of barbershop, you know, uh, a discussion about it uh, before. But if you can, like, I guess maybe uh, concisely put what your, I don't want to say position is, but uh, let, let, let's start Let's start with COVID-19. Um, it's a thing. It's a reality. It's happening right now. What uh, would... COVID, what, what, what are your thoughts and feelings on COVID-19, um, and more specifically, the uh, government's response, this, this administration's response to COVID-19, and, and if that's not hard enough, what you foresee four more years of this administration's response to COVID-19 versus Joe Biden's administration's um, response to COVID-19. So we'll start with uh, Brandon and then right after Brandon, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go over to David. So let me make sure uh, I answer your question, Warner, right. uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a powerful one. Um, what are the issues around COVID-19? And one thing that I've mentioned prior is to talk about the fact that COVID-19, in my opinion, exposed what in some cases poor people already knew. Uh, when you talk about the lack of access to quality health care, I should know because I'm the president of a, of a board of a health care clinic in Detroit. And now we're seeing record numbers of people who are coming in that don't have health insurance. Um, it also exposed the fact that minority businesses are fractured. They're fragile. And in many cases, if they don't have the revenues to stay afloat, they're going out of business. We knew that COVID just fully exposed that. And so I think when you talk about the administration, um, you know, I don't just hold the presidential, the president accountable, uh, but I also hold governors accountable. I also hold mayors accountable uh, because at the end of the day, the president, the governors and the mayors, uh, many of those didn't expect. I mean, no one saw a global pandemic or pandemic, however you want to call it or refer to it. No one saw that coming. And so now the question is, uh, if you if Donald Trump wins re-election, uh, his issue has got to be, he's the president that happens to be leading a nation during probably one of the most horrific pandemics uh, outside of 1918. And he's got to figure out how to get the economy back. He's got to restore, in some cases, uh, a plan of how do you keep Americans safe? But then the other part of that, and I think this is not a, a Donald Trump or Joe Biden problem, this is a media problem. The media has to be held accountable where this is not the time for sensationalism. I should know I'm in the media, but this is a time where people need facts. They don't need the leftist agenda coming from MSNBC. They don't need the conservative agenda coming out of Fox News. They need the truth. And so the challenge is, uh, is the media going to be held accountable when it comes to accurate reporting? Um, the other part of that, if you have a Joe Biden presidency, uh, he's got to um, redefine what does it mean to be safe, but also he's got an economy to run, the one of the largest economies in the world. And so when you talk about places like Detroit uh, that, are, that have taken a, a very severe hit to this, once he becomes the president, he can no longer go back and blame 45 or Donald Trump or whoever you want, he's got to have a plan to how do you keep uh, commerce and the economy going in this environment, specifically for minority businesses, because those are the ones that are, that are the most hardest hit. Uh, he can no longer play the blame game. And so I always say, uh, you know, it's easy to, to, to blame someone when you're not in the seat. When you're in the seat, then you got to have a plan. And so I think that that will be interesting if uh, Joe Biden does win. And so I think uh, we're in some very interesting times. Warner, you talked about, you know, your daughter earlier. Uh, this is the new normal. As much as I, you know, I, I miss the old normal. Uh, this is the new normal where uh, people are a little bit more health savvy. People are a little bit more mm -hmm. conscious of their surroundings. People are a little bit more uh, focused on um, uh, a, a distancing like we've never been before. And so I think that, you know, as they did in 1918, the difference is, thank God, we've got technology to communicate. They didn't have that when my grandmother was a child or great grandmother was a child. And so I think that, you know, technology will be our key. But here's the other factor. 
in addition to COVID, and Warner, I know we'll get into this, this conversation later, the next big issue around COVID-19 is now technology and automation. And how is that going to impact the lives of Americans moving forward? Yeah, um, so the utilization of the federal government to combat COVID-19 um, as if it's a major pandemic like Brandon was talking, which it is, and has not been employed in a centralized manner. Um, one possibility, it's not, uh, uh, and, and I think these things are really difficult, but was to create an enormous amount of testing to happen uh, in, in a uh, great deal with all Americans, basically, and, and undocumented, all human beings in this country. And my understanding is that our current president um, did not do that. He, uh, he did not create a centralized effort. He let governors do it. Some did it in different ways, but he, and he constantly gave a signal to, uh, to reopen. <clears throat> um, this may have lost many lives, particularly lives of poor folks and people of color. I think uh, one thing that Brandon mentioned about technology, and there is obviously so, such great thing, but one surreal aspect to where we're all living as well is, is the fact that so much news comes from so many places, many of which are online and not from sources, from sources with big agendas. Um, so this makes whatever is truth so, even if I talk to somebody and say, oh yeah, we're supposed to wear a mask and we're supposed to social distance, people say, oh, that people could literally have a look at online and see lots, like a big blog, I guess, or where that's not the case. So that's where it becomes pretty scary. Um, but one thing I am hoping in an existential way is that if Biden were elected, he would pool the resources of the federal government to uh, engage in a, a much more testing. Um, I agree also though, when it comes to healthcare, for who? This did lay bare enormous inequality, one, one side of which has to do with healthcare. Um, so I think that is quite interesting, but uh, I think this president was ridiculous and continues to be ridiculous in his denial of the situation and not wanting to pool the resources of the country. <clears throat> there was a couple of things that was stated by uh, one of our viewers. And that is that uh, what, is, what, what is a fact is the, the number of sick people in this country right now, um, the number of people dying from this pandemic in this country right now. And well, me personally, I feel that uh, until this president, this president or this administration comes to grips with the fact that this thing is deadly, that is, it is, it is way more deadly than the flu, and we're now at a point where we're going into the fall and the winter where more people are going to be inside. So therefore more people are going to be contracting this disease. So um, first and foremost, what needs to be done is they just need to need to come to grips with the fact that no, this thing is not just going away unless we're talking about herd immunity, where if we are talking about herd immunity, then we're looking at it maybe uh, 2 million people at minimum are going to die in this country. Until we can, until we can get the, the the, the doses that we need for everybody to basically come to grips and, and get past this thing, masks are the best thing right now for the country. So we need to, I, me personally, that's how, how I feel. I just feel that he needs to come to grip with that. And the country is so fractured right now between people believing, well, hey, well, um, 
nobody that I know has died uh, or, or, um, or it looks like you can just catch it and it'll just go away. That's not the case with everyone. So therefore we need to put in place something that needs to be done. And the first thing needs to be done is the, is the mask and the, and the hand sanitizing and, and, and all of that, then that needs to be done. And at this point, this administration is not doing it. So I feel that um, from what I can see, and I hope that if we do get another administration in there, hopefully they will do that. If not, then we're gonna be looking at herd immunity until they get, until they get the vaccine to take care of this thing. And like, like people were saying, people are scared to take the vaccine if President Trump is saying, well, the vaccine is ready because everybody feels that he's going to be saying that um, a couple of days, a couple of days out before the election. Oh, we got the vaccine and it's ready. So you all need to take it. Uh, we need to deal with the science. And that's the problem right now. We got too many people that are bucking the science, not just on not just on the pandemic, but on global warming and everything else. Science is what it's all about. So let's look into the science take note of what they're saying and follow their direction. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're already in the place where this country has more COVID deaths than any other country in the world. Right, uh, and, 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 thank, and thank you for that. But I actually, when I, I looked up something, because, so I have, and we're gonna move beyond COVID because unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, COVID is not the only thing we'll be voting for, because um, there are many, uh, pressing issues that I, I would imagine um, of, uh, are of importance, but, but it is absolutely understandable, understandable that COVID is at the top of the top of the hill for that. But I was reading something. So um, America, uh, just in, with regard to, because I had this conversation with a, a friend of mine who also doesn't lean left or right, but uh, he, yeah, he, he, it's, it's questionable what, you know, what side of the, the fence he leans on. But but he, he said something to me. Uh, he said, you know, Warner, you know, there are over 8 million, you know, people in this country. And the facts are, the facts are that I believe only 200,000 people have died of, of Corona. Now, in a vacuum, 200,000 is a lot. Uh, with regard to amongst 8 million people, um, I don't even think that's a quarter or it might be a quarter, I, my, my math is wrong. But my response to him, and he was like, Warner, that's a fact, that's a fact. And I said, and I told him, I was like, well, you know what, that, 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 that is true, that, that is true. You know, I looked it up on several sites and that is true. Um, COVID fortunately has not killed um, more people than it has, however, I said that of those 200,000 people, I can assure you that none of them wanted to be the ones that have died, right? So while the fact is only 200,000 have died, nobody wants their grandmother or mother or grandfather or uncle or baby, forgive me, that's my baby crying in the background, uh, children to be amongst that number. And therein lie, I think, um, I think an issue like again, both things can be true at the same time. That that yes, COVID has not killed. It's not the 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 you know. It's not like the the bubonic plague that is killed. That is just wiping out everyone. Yes, okay, that that that, that is true. Um, but what's also true is that uh, that people are dying, and no one wants to die, um, uh, or no one wants to uh, have their relative be the person that dies of this. And and if there is administration that's telling you that is not as bad as it seems, you know, don't fear it, don't be like this, you know, that can be disingenuous to a family that has lost um, people or a person to it. Um, but I, I, I want to, because there, there are a lot, and I don't know if we're going to get through all of them. Um, in the last conversation, uh, a coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 moved seamlessly into healthcare. Um, but for lack of a seamless uh, 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 transition, I'm just going to do a hard stop. <clears throat> Let's just go into healthcare. So, so healthcare, um, and, and anyone can chime in on this if, if you have it. Uh, Okay, so as our healthcare stands today, to, to Brandon's, uh, what Brandon, uh, one of the things he said, he said, uh, one thing COVID did do 
was exposed the fact that, you know, a lot of people in poor, you know, poor people, uh, you know, black and brown people um, don't either don't have health care at all, which is tragic, um, or have very poor health care. Um, how would health care look um, under a continue under this administration, um, uh, given what we know, um, versus how would health care or how do we foresee health care based on what, you know, Senator Kamala Harris has talked about, based on what uh, 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 presidential nominee Joe Biden has talked about, what, what do we, I don't know, expect health care to look like um, in the next administration? Um, and again, anyone can, can chime in. This is a kind of a, a free for all. Warner, I, I'll speak to that only because I deal with health care okay. uh, or lack thereof. Um, couple things here. So I think Gil talked about following the science. The challenge is we follow the science in the textbooks, but we don't follow the urban science to know that uh, the relationship between healthcare and Black folks in America has not been a good one. Uh, if you want to go back 70 years to the Tuskegee experiment, and I always use that example because that was the precipice that was exposed. There were more situations uh, where there was a mistrust of healthcare and hospitals uh, with helping and serving those people who did not have the means uh, to, to pay for quality healthcare. So let, let's, let's put that out there. There's a, there's a mistrust of African-Americans, specifically black males uh, to even go to the doctor. And so when you talk about health rates, uh, most, I've, I've talked to brothers, we actually talked about this in a barbershop the other day, brothers don't go get checkups. They don't. And then when they drop dead or when they have complications that are already uh, too late to deal with, now it's a crisis. And so I think, uh, and so the, the kudos that I will give uh, not by, not Joe Biden, I will give Barack Obama the credit for this, is that he had early conversations about simply Black men going to get checked up or checkups. The challenge with that is when you talk about the health care plan, part of Obamacare, some good things. But the other part of that is that Obamacare, if you actually read the bill, it was, and I think people need to know this when they're voting because sound bites oftentimes uh, take over what are people actually voting for so that they know it. It was a health insurance reform bill. It was not a health care access bill. Now, why is that important? Because just because you have access to something, listen to the wordplay, doesn't mean you actually have it. And the other <clears throat> challenge with that is that there was a fine of $2,000 if you didn't get it. So it was really more of a tax than it was a help for those people who didn't have it. And so that's why people were saying, well, how much of that will, you know, could I still keep my uh, old insurance versus versus if I have a pre-existing condition? So I think the challenge that you'll see, and I think the problem is no one in Washington, Democrats or Republicans, uh, is actually working on a sufficient health care plan that resolves the issue of uh, how do poor people get access to health care and not be penalized for it. That's the key part, is that in some cases, you can't keep your, your former health care coverage. Uh, I think under this administration, um, or excuse me, I think if, if Joe Biden wins, uh, I think the challenge is there's probably gonna be a return to Obamacare. Now, like I said, uh, you know, both situations really didn't address the issue of how do you resolve and give people access to quality health care. Um, but I think one at least poses the conversation. And so I think if the president is reelected, he's got to come up with a sufficient plan which targets both health care and the economy because they go both in hand. Uh, when people lose their job, they lose their health care coverage in some cases. And so I think that that has to be an issue that I can tell you right now because I deal with it, neither party is working on. And so the issue is it's not up to the politicians, which it should be. It's up to the voters to demand that if Joe Biden gets in or if Trump gets back in, we've got to have a reform to even Obamacare. We've got to have a health care plan.
that actually gives people quality access to it and not is basically a kickback for the insurance for the health insurance companies. That's what it is. Um, and so I think that comes back with just uh, having information. I, I'm going I'm to get a Fulton, uh, Fulton Street, uh, uh, Mr. Fulton Hodges uh, for <laughs> the uninitiated. Um, he has been on with us from the beginning. He is uh, he's been upgraded to a panelist. I mean, he was always in on the conversation, but um, but I, I would really, really love to, to hear from you if you have any, I guess, insights or um, I don't know, perspectives with regard to what we we were just uh, hitting on. Well, thank you, sir. It's good to see you, Warner. Good to see you uh, it's good to see all of you brothers. And you too, David. You're a brother too. He's a brother <laughs> okay. too. He just likes me. Um, just likes me. Yeah. You, <laughs> you, sit <there> and <laughs> you sit back and you talk about uh, affordable health care. And Brandon, you hit it right on the head when you talk about the reform. All right, because people do not understand that it has to be. Well, Biden did say that there has to be some changes to Obama, Obamacare also. Mm -hmm. All right. People need to understand and need to know this. But you have a president now that wants to take it all away. He wants to take the whole thing away. And then when you ask him, what are you going to give? In return, what is it that's going to replace this if you take it away? And he can't even answer you. What he, he gives you a whole bunch of run on sentences. And he goes, you know, well, we got some very good ideas coming up. We have some very, I said, no, I don't want to hear what you have coming up. I want to hear what you have now. That's what I want to hear. Forget about what's coming up, all right? You in the presidential election and people want to know because one of the most important things that people talk about, all right, the COVID, uh, police brutality, racial, you mess with their health care. You mess with their health care and they go, you know, they get crazy. Okay, you know, and you have a president also who is trying to take away Medicare and Medicaid already. He even said this. He even put it out there and you have a whole bunch of people that are saying you can't take away my health care. You have 20 million people that are part of Obamacare right now. All right. My my uh, thing is and yeah, I will, you know, be voting for uh, Biden because I want to see what it is that he is going to add to this and to this uh, uh, what is already out there. If you're going to make it better, then fine, make it better. But you know, you got to make it affordable for everybody. You just can't make it affordable for these people, these people. And you know, it is very, very well known that uh, uh, black people, people, brown people, people of color, they have had um, issues with affordable health care. They've been I said, if you're going to take care of the United States, which I do have a serious problem with the current administration, because you don't say I'm going to send money to this city and not send it to the other cities. This is the United States. This is not the red states of America. You got to do it for everybody. And this is where I see the disparities with one administration as opposed to one that's trying to get in. I say, you're not helping everybody. You're only helping for your rich and uh, powerful uh, uh, executive CEOs and stuff. That one percentage that we always hear about, that one percentage, work for everybody. Work for everybody because this is what people are voting on. Because I trust the men on this on this Zoom call, I'm 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 a trust that that you're gonna give a, a very honest answer. Um, in for the sake of, of of fairness or balance, has President Trump done any redeemable thing during his presidency? Absolutely. The issue is, and and, and, and if he has, what 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 has it been? I'll tell you what it is. Um, and before I say this, let me put this in context. Um. I am a student of politics and I'm a businessman. And I'm always focused on how are black people benefiting and moving forward. 
Um, I think a couple of things that the, the last administration did not do that this administration is doing, one is prison reform. And why is that important? Because I think the question is the conversation, the national conversation is now on how do we reform prison and are we creating criminals that we're sending to these penitentiaries? Now, some may say, well, it's a cost issue and that's why the administration cares about it. Fine, if it's reducing the number of black males that are frivolously going to be incarcerated, then I support that. Uh, the other thing is it goes back into drug policy. And that conversation has been something that this, I've seen that this administration uh, has taken much more serious about uh, decriminalizing drugs. And so, and I can tell you one thing, I've worked on this where now the national conversation, which did not happen four or eight years or even 12 years earlier, is, is a person who is dealing with addiction uh, worthy of being sent to prison or do they need to be hospitalized and put in some kind of coverage or some kind of social service sector to wean them off of these drugs? And so I think the administration has done well in taking that conversation serious. The other thing is, uh, and I wanna get into, we'll kind of get into this platinum plan project because I, I'll go into it, but when you talk about black businesses, the SBA eight years ago uh, took a major back turn uh, which you would have thought that Barack Obama would have taken uh, supporting and funding black businesses a little bit more serious <laughs> than he did. Uh, part of that, some will say, well, his focus was healthcare and that's where a bunch of the funding went. Fine, I get it. But I think when you talk about the state of black businesses, especially now after COVID, uh, let's look at a couple of things here. And I think this president, uh, I'll give credit where credit's due. These are the two or three of the things that I will say I like that he's done is he's highlighted the need for more African-American and more minority businesses uh, in terms of funding them and startup capital. Why is that important? Because most African-Americans, and this now gets into credit, uh, when you talk about collateral and bonding, a lot of these guys can't go start a business. They can't go get a loan from the bank because they don't have the startup costs and capital. And so I think the federal government pushing through SBA has been one factor. But the other thing is many, when you talk about who hires in the black community, so let's get deep. Let's talk about Detroit. Let's talk about New Orleans. Let's talk about Chicago. And, and, and just real quick, Brent, I, I just want to make sure I, I want to get some other, some other brothers in on this sure, too, because sure, I, sure. I know they have some. Sure. So, so go ahead. Quick, I'm sorry. Real quick, when we talk about Chicago and all these other urban cities, it's people who technically look like them who hire them. And so when you talk about issues, and maybe this should be much more prevalent in conversations between both candidates, the rate of taxation and what does taxation mean for someone who uh, works on Park Avenue versus for someone who lives in the Bronx? Two completely different answers. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, but before, um, cause I, uh, cause I, I posed that same original question to, um, to, to all of you, if, and, and if you say nothing, that's, that's legitimate as well. That's I just want, mean. I just want to say that, uh, Go ahead. right quick that, um, mm -hmm. Obama couldn't do a lot of things that he wanted to do because he was handcuffed by the Senate. Not the first two years. Not the first two years. Hold on. Well, well, the first two years, he was busy trying to, he was busy trying to, I ain't making excuses for nobody, but he was busy trying to get uh, certain things in his agenda done as far as health care and all that stuff. He was working on that. He, he went through a lot of stuff with that. But what I'm saying is once, um, once the Senate, became Republican, mm -hmm. everything that he brought to the table just sat in the Senate, everything. Mm -hmm. um, case in point, look at what happened with the judge. They, the, they, he wanted to get, he wanted to nominate a particular judge for, <laughs> uh, he wanted to nominate him, but I mean, nominate that judge, but it got, hand, he was handcuffed. He couldn't do anything. All right. So they said from the uh, oh well, it's a, it's a it's a year of an election, so we're not even going to touch that. Now, you see the difference. They just it is we in the middle of an election, and they pushing through a candidate. So I, I'm just I just wanted to make that make that point right quick. 
Right. Thank you. Thank you, man. Um, I, one thing uh, was said in the chat uh, with regard to prison reform, because that's that's actually, you know, I'm not I'm not a one issue voter, um, but certainly prison reform, uh, criminal reform. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, prison reform, a uh, police reform um, are definitely high on my I guess my uh, my, my list of things that I'm looking for. But uh, it was said that, you know, yes, uh, whereas Trump may have a uh, president Trump may have uh, uh, made certain policy shifts uh, uh, or improvements with regard to prison reform. On the with the same hand, he's also kind of made it hard, not kind of made it uh, a far more challenging for prisoners to vote. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's kind it's kind <clears throat> of uh, you know uh, with one hand, yeah, but with another hand, you know, it, it gets taken away. Um, so you know, just to kind of put that in a bucket. But um, but David, uh, I hate to put you on the spot with this, but I, is is there anything you know as the you know very um, unapologetic, uh, you know, very progressive as you are, um, is there anything to your estimation that Trump has done during his, his administration that's been redeemable in your eyes? I think that there's a lot of information you said yourself. I, I don't have a lot of it. I'm not, a, I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't think I am as involved in healthcare and in many issues. And also I do have a business, but I don't, I don't think I'm the kind of businessman that, that uh, Brandon is and, and, and have the energy for that. I will say my understanding is what he did for prison reform was help push through a bill that percentage wise for the amount of people aided compared to the amount of people that there are was not a huge percentage of what he had. It did do some help. My also understanding when it comes to a larger issue of for-profit prison, which is much bigger which has to do with business and money and unbelievable uh, abuses and lack of care for the topic of whatever you wanna say of it, of rehabilitation or the topic of human beings incarcerated, um, but has much more to do with money and then has also been involved in for-profit for detention facilities for what's gone on with immigration. Um, it is, a huge amount of things this man has done that weren't, many of which were not a big departure though from before him. So what I wanna say is that th there was a partial thing that I did do think he did something good uh, in helping that bill push, be, be pushed forward um, that was came from some person uh, of color who- Van Jones. Know, uh, yes, yes, that, that that spoke to him. But this man doesn't care. I mean, I just feel like it's so obvious. This guy doesn't care about anything but his own ego. I mean, he's got some serious emotional problems. Besides that, though, I, I wanted to just put, put because we were talking about healthcare for a moment, too. And I, um, uh, my understanding is, is if Obamacare just went away, there would be millions of people that would have nothing, whether you want to call what they have now quality or lack of quality, they would have nothing. But mm -hmm. besides, besides, and I think that's, I think that's the case if it were to, and, and like Fulton was saying, there's been nothing put forward to replace it except talk. And, and again, I don't, this guy, I don't think cares at all. I do want to go back though, for a second, just around, being the most powerful, richest country in the world, and then having a number of other countries that are smaller, many of which have less people of color in them, like Scandinavian countries, you know, where the, the um, longevity age, people living longer lives than in America, where people have healthcare, Medicare, like for all, for every individual that it's a right, for people to be able to be healthy. And that it's not where some people, if they have money or they own a business or this or that, they, they can live <clears throat> when they have cancer. And this is where I just don't understand why people would not believe if so many other countries have done it. Not that it's easy and not that Canada is, is paradise, but right to our North, why can't everybody get health care? Why can't being a human being here make you deserve to have a doctor without having a job connected to it? Um, 
And this is not what Biden wants. Uh, he, he, he maybe wants to expand uh, and maybe lower the age, I believe, of, of Medicare, I think. Um, but so, and, and, and the last thing I just want to say that, you know, I, I, I never knocked on doors or gave money before Obama's <laughs> first election. And I was excited and I saw long, I live in a Caribbean American neighborhood in Brooklyn that were long lines, people 95 to little kids on these long lines. There was so much energy behind him. And I was so excited. And I thought, wow, what if this guy brings this energy into volunteerism and activates this so everybody in the country gets on the street to make change? Obama put Wall Street types all through his cabinet Income inequality did not decrease. Oh, it wasn't just the it wasn't just that the the Congress, like which was a, a valid point about the Congress being becoming Republican after two years, he became part of a system that, to be honest, is all about big corporate interests, yep. and he did not put a big wrench in that system. <laughs> Uh, I do think he was an unbelievable speaker and one of the best I think we've ever had. Um, but when it comes to brass tacks of business more important than people's lives, no matter how much money, he totally catered, I believe, to Wall Street and to business. The difference with Trump is it's super obvious. It's all, and, and then his lies are, and, and it's all about business. Um, now, I, I don't want to equate them totally because I definitely would prefer Obama like I would prefer Biden, but I think that the, that the system itself needs to have a total overhaul and value life and human beings who live in this area called the country. Let me th th thank you, David. We're actually gonna we're gonna segue because we were talking about health. We're gonna actually transition in a moment to to women's health. Uh, you know, none of us are, women, but we're gonna uh, talk about that. But before I do, I just wanna I just wanna read a couple of things. So, um, with regard to President Trump, so uh, and I I would imagine that most of you now all of you are aware of this. So uh, last I believe in December of 2019, President Trump um, signed a bipartisan bill that will permanently provide more than $250 million a year to HBCUs. Um, many, yeah, many, yeah, many of my, 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 uh, they would, they would, they wouldn't call themselves Republicans. They would call themselves conservative. My conservative black friends, um, who are, who are voting for Trump. There are, they are out there. Um, one of the things that they continuously Say is that yes, he's the one that you know, uh, you know, gave money to HBCUs. You know, it's a permanent thing, so he did that. Um, but I, I want to uh, read this other thing, um, uh, and, and that came from the BBC, which is, and this here's the as an aside, the uh, the ironic thing about our news. I get mo much of my news about the United States from the BBC, which is crazy because I don't, you know, it it, it seems very partisan in this country about ourselves, but yet a foreign news source gives me the most accurate news. But anyway, yes, African-American unemployment has gone down under President Trump. However, it was already on the incline with Barack Obama. So, you know, it's it, yes, is it true that unemployment has gone down during President Trump? Sure, that is a fact. However, it was already on the down swing under Barack Obama. Uh, unemployment rate, uh, the poverty rate, uh, African American poverty rate, uh, which is the lowest on record during this presidency. Um, however, again, there was all there was a downward trend during President Obama's uh, presidency. So yes, while it is a fact that excuse me, African American poverty has gone down during uh, President Trump's presidency. There was all there was prior to him the downward trend of it going down. So that's some like uh, uh, maybe Brandon brought it up, you know, in, in, with regard to our news sources. So when 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 a news source or even our president says yes, he's done a lot for Black people, that can be very much misleading. Um, it can be a fact 
and disingenuous at the same time. Um, uh, and just this last thing, uh, and again, this is all from the BBC, you, you can read yourselves. Uh, African-American arrests have gone down under President Trump. That is a fact. However- However, shootings have gone up. Shootings, okay, well, I, I, I don't have that, so I, I can't speak on that. I don't have that in front of me. But I, again, it, I will say that it has been going down since, and it actually was at its lowest in 2015. It was, it was already on the way down, uh, you know, every year, 2010, 2011, 2012, it was already on the way down. Um, so again, these are facts that can be misleading. Um, and that's the unfortunate thing. Um, but yes, to uh, so, so let's let's kind of se let's segue over to women's rights. So, uh, anyone have <laughs> any thoughts on a uh, 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 court uh, judge nominee uh, Amy uh, Amy Barrett's uh, nomination and and what she or at least this administration plans to do with Roe versus Wade? So or, 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 or maybe that's too big. Maybe just about Amy Barrett. But I mean, choose to answer it however however you like. Or, I'm going to add a couple comments on Amy Barrett um, because I think this is important. Uh, we have two black females on this call. We have African-American women who in some cases are more, uh, are receiving more professional degrees than their African-American male counterparts. Mm -hmm. And I was a little shocked that it's taken 200 plus years to put a black female on the US Supreme Court. And I was more shocked that when Barack Obama was the president, uh, that was not considered nor did it happen when he had control of the Senate. So what that tells me is that we still have some very serious challenges around not only women's rights, but women of color's rights. Now, as it relates to the Amy Barrett decision, um, I think there were some people who had concerns that it was too early uh, and that the next president should be able to pick that. Uh, Warner, the reality is I say, unfortunately, it's politics and it's the way Washington works. Uh, he who controls the courts controls mm -hmm. the presidency if we wanna just be straight up. Uh, and so I think that that was the bigger issue, but I, I also looked at it to say, uh, I actually think it was a blown opportunity for the president that if uh, if he really wanted to make an impact, wouldn't it have been nice for the president Trump, whether you love him or hate him, to say, I put the first black female on the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, I just wanted to say that he's appointed um, well over 100 judges in this country on the lower courts mm -hmm. and not one of them was a black person. I just wanted to get that out there. Not one of them was African-American, period. Wait, by, 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 by he, are you, are you speaking about the current president? president? I'm talking about the current president. He put, okay. um, I, I think it's close to 150 judges in the Two, low- 220, 220, uh, Michelle is saying. Okay, all right. Oh, damn, I didn't even know it was that many. But what I'm saying is, I knew it was a, a, a stark number and all of them are conservative judges and not one of them was black. He put some women in there, but not one of them were a, was a person of color, period. And, and, and to, to Brandon's point uh, about uh, 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 former President Obama, uh, missed an opportunity to put a black woman. I mean, he did put Sonia Santomayor. She's not black, but she is a, a woman of color. And, and I, you know, I, I, there, there's a difference, but she, but he did appoint a so woman I, of I, color I, I, in the Supreme, in Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, let me just, let me just add something to this because Brandon had put on, picked up on a, a, a great point, okay? The, and this goes all the way back to the voting thing that we're talking about right here and now. If you did not sleep on, uh, I don't know when the midterm elections was in 2014, 2000, if you did not sleep on that, you wouldn't have had a Republican House 
and the Republican Senate, a lot of people did not think it was important to vote at that particular time. They said, well, it's not the presidency, so I do not have to vote. And they just want to spiral also back to what's one of the things that Brandon said. If you are going to vote, you do not just vote for the president. If you want change, you got to do senators, you got to do the uh, um, congressmen, you got to go all the way down into what people are running these cities. Okay, those, the attorney generals, you got to make the change all the way down the line. You don't just go into the booth and say, I'm just voting for the president and forget about everybody else. Okay, because that effectively is where the change comes. I'm sorry, I need to go ahead. <laughs> No, 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 no thank you. You got to vote top to bottom. You're right. Uh, right, right before, uh, and again, I'll, if if anyone uh, has any, um, you know, anything to say with regard to uh, 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 the prospective Supreme Court, uh, uh, Amy Barrett, you know, please speak I up. Mean, but oh, go ahead, go ahead, David. She, she, you know, my understanding is in the her answering the questions around things like Roe versus Wade uh, around. Um, whether or not uh, there is such a thing as voter suppression right now, mm -hmm. where and meanwhile we have militias with guns, white supremacist, uh, admittedly organizations coming, standing with these big fucking M fifty one whatever they are, and and she basically said I can't talk about it and said logical things that a judge would say about every case is different and I have to listen to this, but voter, she wouldn't even acknowledge the fact that, and, and besides that, uh, another little issue that these domestic terrorists, uh, white supremacy organizations are the majority of literal murders going on, murders. And like, and, and they're all over the place and it's been around for forever, but and this administration, this president does, has constantly tried to uh, bring up Antifa, Antifa leftist. It's not equivalent. And when uh, a person was killed in Charlotte, that's what, you know, the thing that supposedly Biden said, that's why he wanted to run is because uh, he was like, well, I was for both sides. I mean, these people support him. Right. So he doesn't want, he's all about me, 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 me. He doesn't care. And plus, to be honest, he's from German. I mean, it, you can get crazy about what's going on right now. This is insane. So this woman, I don't, I mean, she looks very nice. She's got a lot of kids, you know, uh, and all that. Very nice. But this isn't a white Christian nation. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to that issue, Roe versus Wade in particular, it, it's obviously it's tricky because for those people who believe that's a human being inside a woman's body, so th those people that believe that, then they're th saying that it's murder, okay? It's murder if a person has an abortion. I understand that, but then there's all these other things going on that's not uh, supporting living people mm -hmm. or, or, or children at the border. So I'm terrified. Uh, you know, the politics thing sounds logical. Mitch McConnell prevented Barack Obama from putting in that justice 10 months before. And then he's like, yeah, go. And it's all a game. It's all a game. And, uh, but I think we might we may be in for some real difficulties for a nation that is eclectic, that is a mixture um, uh, when, when it comes to tolerance, when it comes to this, this really frightening thing of white supremacy. I mean, not that that doesn't exist anyway, but that violent militias. And for some reason she seemed, her, her nomination you know, makes me even more nervous about that in, in a certain way. And I, I, I get that as we move on to the next thing. I, I, you know, again, like you, David, and again, I would still concede that you probably are more um, uh, astute with regard to, you know, different policies, but, you know, just, just on a very base level, um, if, if, if a person, particularly a person in power and leadership um, doesn't even uh, submit that there is a problem um, that can be a very frightening thing and alarming thing for the for the people who are who are uh, who who are dealing you know very intimately with those problems. So you know for a perf for you know you can't heal a thing unless you say it is is there 
you know, and, and if you have these people in leadership that won't even concede that, oh yeah, that, that is a thing, you know, systemic, you know, racism is a thing or, you know, or, or, or even just to, to the, or even just because I know that's a debatable thing, but even the need for police reform or, or though if, if you're even unwilling to concede that that is even a thing and you're in leadership, um, that can be very alarming. That, that, that can be very alarming, especially for the people that it affects uh, personally. Um, Amen. But let's, but let's again, hard transition to uh, if, if and, and I'll just put it out there. If you have anything to say, don't don't feel pressured to say anything if you don't. But um, with regard to the economy, um, like I just read a couple stats uh, care of the BBC uh, with regard to, you know, what the economy has been. Um, I it had it all the way from 2010, but, you know, it was. Uh, the economy was on on the downtick, um, and that continued under, uh, you know, hate him or love him under Donald Trump. So uh, the economy, what uh, do you think our economy looks like uh, in, in another four years under the current administration um, versus uh, something under uh, Biden and Harris? Warner, Anyone can chime in. Warner, I'm going to say this. I actually think the economy is the one thing that the president uh, right now is it's in his favor. Um, we were at 3% prior I've to heard that. that. The challenge is uh, my concern, I watched the vice presidential debates and Kamala Harris, lover or hater, she said, um, if we're elected, the nation will look like California. Now, let me tell you why that's a big problem. Uh, California right now, businesses are running from California because the taxes are, are, are so high that people mm -hmm. can't even afford to live in California. Hell, go to San Francisco and you'll see what I'm talking about. The issue with that is that my, my belief is that the, what the president has done well is he's made sure that the economy stayed afloat. Now, this was a big issue. If we go back to, I think it was April or May when there was a conversation, do we open up the economy or do we risk lives? And the left painted it as a picture that said, oh, well, the president doesn't care about people and the economy needs to take a second, you know, needs to take a back seat. I challenge that for anyone who understands the economy, they both were slow deaths. One was just much faster than the other. Because when you talk about the economy, let's think about what that means. When a person cannot afford to feed their family, they're at risk. When a person loses their job, they're at risk. When a person uh, does not have enough who starts a business uh, is being so taxed to the point where they can no longer hire people or let alone stay in business and that is their life, they're at risk. And so when you talk about, uh, we were talking about earlier, the issues around uh, police reform and rioting, a big part of social unrest, whether you wanna admit it or not, is the economy. Because when people get desperate and when people get uh, concerned that they don't know where their next meal is, we know that's a factor in crime. We know that's a factor in rioting. And we know that that's a factor in civil unrest. And so I think that uh, what the president needs to do if he is reelected is he's got to, and I think the issue with the platinum plan, and I don't want to get into the ice cube conversation, but it's an important All one. Right. Because the challenge is, why wasn't that conversation had in 2019? Why two weeks before the damn election? Mm -hmm. that hey, is, even, I mean, I mean, even to someone who, again, is not a, a poli sci major, I, I, I understand when someone's trying to, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you well, know, get, know, get votes. You know, what I'm saying, I, 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 I even I see that. I, to David's point, that you know, that's a pretty obvious thing. But that's you know, that's that's politics. Like every year, you know, they never visit. Harlem or any black church and, and then around it, they come to yeah. So, I mean, I, I get it. That, that's the game that they play. So I just have one. If, if, I just want to ask you, though, Brent, you say, you know, the economy and I agree with you. It, the economy has been that one point that has been in the favor of Trump. OK, but here you have COVID-19. Why can't you take care of both of them as opposed to one or the other. If you are supposed to be presidential, you're supposed to take care of the any situation that affects the entire country. The economy does and COVID-19 does on this side. 
he should be able to take care of both of them without having to go over all the way over here and deal with this and say, well, we're going to deal with this herd immunity, which has been passed around in the White House very, very recently, and let COVID-19 take run its course. We need to have him take care of all of the stuff. If you are there to take care of the job, now you got your people behind you that support you in that, but you got to take care of it if you're going to be presidential. That was one of the biggest things that I had a problem with because he will deal with one situation and not deal with the, all these other situations. That's that's my point on that. David, I see you. Go ahead. No, I just I I, I take. I mean, I've heard many people speak that the two the huge tax credit that he gave to super wealthy folks that's gonna create the biggest deficit that we've ever had uh, in all time, the incredible income inequality that, that's, that's been going on, the amount of working poor, whether the unemployment is down or not, the amount of people struggling in this country. And, and you saying the economy, uh, Brandon saying the economy was great. He's done so well with the economy. When you look at the numbers of actually human beings and people of color in this country, you, uh, and I understand what you're saying, Warren, I guess about these, the, the lower of poverty, but the gap going bigger and bigger and bigger. I don't know. And, and the intelligence and his total uh, uh, around making decisions in general, I have, part of me has no idea what you're talking about when you, you're saying this guy is the genius uh, uh, of, of forgiving the economy when we're in the biggest, we'll have the biggest deficit ever that he gave all this money. There was some, uh, a smaller amount to some people, but, uh, and, and, then, and then also when it comes to dealing with COVID, when it comes to uh, creating jobs like FDR did during uh, that depression, that great depression that galvanized the economy at that time, taking huge steps, like I said, with the government to maybe create testing or do, do things that would provide a, a huge amount of jobs. I can't imagine that would be a bad thing for, for this country. I don't know how successful or not it, it will be, but I know that this man doesn't give two hoots about uh, uh, poor people, about working people, or obviously about, about people of color. He o only thinks about himself. And yes, part of that is, is about money. Um, and I, again, I, I, the country's not a business. It's, it just isn't. It's, it's, it's different. It's a different animal than pure zero sum game uh, about, about money. It's also about humans and about education and creativity and culture. And I mean, he wanted to get rid of of the National Endowment. He wants. He talks about get rid of PBS. He, he doesn't. Uh, and and then when it comes to education, uh, you know, these privatization of schools. I mean, there's so many. Uh, uh, the, the, it's it's a it's a joke. With the, all the people that he's appointed to, uh, for the for the Food and Drug Administration or for the Environmental Protection Agency, people who have said we should get rid of it are now in charge of it. And they're all like lobbyists for big corporations. And how you could sit there and think that this man is somebody you who obviously care about people of color, care, care about black and brown people, how you could possibly think that this person should even be in the same sentence as somebody that, that uh, is, is, is an option. I don't, I really don't understand. I'll, and before, because I, I know you, Brandon, want to uh, speak to this or maybe speak. Um, I, I'll, I'll say this, David, is, and again, I well, I didn't begin this in, uh, version of our discussion by saying it, um, but but I'll say now, I, I I don't lean. Depending on the topic, is the way that I lean with regard to my political affiliations. I, I regard myself as a you know politically homeless, and 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 with that, you know. Um, during these times of years, uh, I get into conversations with friends because of the the circles I run in who are who are left leaning uh, and right leaning. And it's, the irony is, to my left leaning friends, they assume that I'm right, and to my right leaning friends, they assume that I'm left. Um, and and I, and I don't do that purposely, but if I don't affirm one thing wholeheartedly, then the assumption is that I'm, I must be playing for the other team. Um, but 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 to, but to the point that you made. Uh, uh, to what you said, David. Um, I know, so my Black friends, 
and granted, they're not the closest, but the people who I would, you know, uh, uh, you know, associate with and, and talk to, um, the ones that have or would vote for Trump, one of the reasons is with regard to what you just said, um, you know, how could you vote for someone who doesn't care about Black people or have their best regard? One of the things that they've said is that he doesn't have to care, but he, he's a businessman. And, you know, and, and, and me as an entrepreneur, I'm talking to them, me as an entrepreneur, listen, he doesn't have to, you know, he, it, it's about business, you know, I, and, and being an entrepreneur, and he gives me the best, you know, tax breaks, and, and these sorts of things. And that sort of thing is about business, 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 the social stuff. That's, you know, you know, whatever the, you know, the, the, me, 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 me trusting him, uh, you know, as a, as a human being, that's whatever. It's about business. And I trust as a business. And, and that's would be wanna, that, that, that would be a retort to what you just said. Want, want, want really quick. I just want to respond to that. Okay. I'll say this, David. Uh, I myself as an independent, I'm a businessman and I'm a person that believes that for far too long. And I'm speaking as a black man. Uh, the black community has been so heavily socially so focused on social justice that we haven't even touched the surface of the economic justice conversation going back to the second thing King was talking about three days before he died. Um, I think the challenge is we've got an opportunity as minorities to say if things in our communities uh, where Democrats, and I'll just put it out there, whether you're Democrat or Republican, that's on you, but in our, these major cities, Baltimore, New Orleans, Detroit, uh, Little Rock, they've been controlled by Democrats for the last 30 years. And black people have gotten the short end of that stick. So the challenge is, and I'm not saying one party is better than the other, but the opportunity now is I think this is an opportunity, whether you support the president or you don't, to say, if it's not working, it's time to change it. And I think mm -hmm. the, the opportunity here, just, just moving forward before we close, is it, it's an opportunity where I think now, not only is it important for people to vote, but it's important for people to start taking responsibility for their own communities and saying, if my schools are trash, it's time to fix it. Mm -hmm. If my mayor is not doing what I need to do, it's time to throw them out. If my congressperson is more focused on the country club then, uh, then, then, then the, then the, uh, then the, uh, you know, then the community center. It's time to get rid of them too. And so I think what Donald Trump presents, whether you like the guy or not, is he presents an opportunity where if you're mad enough, go out there and vote, uh, or if you're happy with the situation and you're starting to see changes, keep the person you got in the White House. The bottom line is, get out and vote and be proactive and stop just running your mouth. Yes, and that is the perfect uh, segue to, I, I, so we're gonna close now. We could literally, and because I'm sure many of us have been in these conversations that have lasted hours, much to our uh, chagrin probably, um, but, but we're gonna close. But I, I, would, I would love for you, because again, as you said, you know, it's about getting out to vote. It's truly is about getting out the vote. Make you know it's, it's it's become cliche now, unfortunately, but truly your voice, your one voice needs to be heard. It truly, truly does. Um, mm -hmm. And um, you know your your voice decides futures. You know, it, the, and the stakes are that high. Um, so if 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 each of us would, uh, as we close, maybe give a, a minute, minute and a half, two minute exhortation, last words, um, what you would like to leave this conversation with, I would um I would ask. Let's uh actually let's start with the uh, uh, Mr. Tucker, since uh, you know. Yeah. Oh, all right. Little, I, I put I put you on the spot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Um, well, what I'm yeah. gonna say is this: that uh, all right. In the last election, um, I I got five kids, and my youngest son, him and I got into a, a disagreement because he felt like, well, look, I don't like Hillary because of what she said about Obama, and blah blah blah, and and all this other stuff that's coming out about her. Um, so, and, and I don't like Trump. So you know what, dad, I ain't going to vote. And I told him, I said, look, um, then whatever happens, don't cry later on about, well, the man is in the office and he's doing this and doing that. Get out and vote. Sometimes it's about voting for either the lesser of two evils, or it's about basically voting for the person 
that has an agenda that's at least closer to what you want said and done. And so all I'm gonna tell you young people, if if you, regardless of what, um, our ancestors fought hard for the opportunity to be able to vote. And in certain areas, they're still trying to block people from going out to vote. Your vote counts, whether you realize it or not, your vote counts. Get it out and vote. That's my point. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hodges. Yeah, the one thing that I would say to people is do not, you know, get discouraged when you see those long lines, because those long lines are because people say, I am going to vote. I am going to make my vote count. We cannot be discouraged because there are factions out there that are trying to suppress the vote. They did it in 2016. They tried to do it in 2018. And now they're trying to do it in 2020. You get out there, whether it's the, the mail-in ballots, okay, whether they, they you know, the, the ballot boxes that they, the fake ones that they're putting out in California, and then you have a, a postmaster general who's taking mailboxes away. And so do not get discouraged. Do not let them discourage you from getting out there to vote. Your, vo your voice matters. Voting is a, a, a right that every individual in this country has. There should be nobody trying to suppress it. So just get out there, vote, and, you know, Choose who you feel, just like Gil said, choose who you feel is more in tune with what it is that you want to see happening. But change only comes if you get out there and vote. Word, right, man. Uh, Mr. Deblinger, please. Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, I didn't mention, uh, it was so nice to hear that you're a dad. Um, uh, Warner and I, I also am a dad. I'm a new dad. I'm an old new dad, but first okay. child, five years old. And, um, and my whole life has changed. And like, uh, I guess, uh, Gail was talking about, it is an amazing age and cause he's so pure and he's so full of life. And I want him to live in a country where everybody's voice matters. And I want everyone who's listening to this, I want everyone who's listening to this to know that your right to vote is exactly that. But if you don't exercise it, then we could, it is actually plausible that we could lose. We could lose it. And it is a time where every single person needs to, to, to exercise their voice and their right, right now. And I agree with, with what Fulton was saying, there are literal forces out that people shed blood to combat. But today, those same forces seem to be alive and well attempting to suppress the vote. Don't let it happen. Vote, please, everybody, no matter who you're voting for, Please vote. And like other people said, up and down the ticket. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for doing this. Everybody, please, thank you so much and, and for inviting me to be part of it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bryce? Mr. Bryce. You know, civility is something that in addition to voting, we need to get back to. And so I tell everyone who's listening to this, uh, uh, this conversation that take the time to vote. And if you don't agree with somebody about their vote, take the time to have a conversation, why or why not? Uh, we all think differently. We all may have different opinions, but in the end, we are all Americans. And the reality is, is that civility is that thing that keeps us safe at night. And so I would say, take the time to vote, do your research, uh, and vote because there are, you know, the tale of two Americas is we could one day wake up and our civil liberties are gone. 
our, our rights to freedom could be gone. And so knowing that, that it's not important who you vote for, but vote for someone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'll, uh, essentially, you guys said everything that was on my heart and mind to uh, even touch on. So uh, I'll just add this little bit. You know, there's a, 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 a passage that says, you know, um, uh, be ready in all seasons to give reason for the, the hope that is in you. Um, um, and I put that on voting too. like well, like everyone said, vote. Um, but I would also add in there, um, as much as you can, give reason, be uh, uh, undergird your voting with, with information. Now, there's a lot of information out there. I get it. And it can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming. I, I totally understand that. You know, not, we're not poli sci majors. We're not, you know, brilliant, you know, professors. So, so I get it. Um, but, there are, but there are some things that, that, that you hold dear, near and dear to you. Listen, we live in an age of information. Get some good information. Understand what these two candidates or 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 political or you know uh, factions you know believe and uh, and 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 vote accordingly. You know um, because the information is out there. Um, so so with your voting, add some understanding with your voting and 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 proceed um, proceed that way. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you for I, all I, your. I and, wanna, I just want to say right quick. Be careful because there is a lot of misinformation out there. One hundred percent. So do your research. Make sure you know exactly mm -hmm. why you're doing what you're doing, why you're voting for who you're voting for, and not yes. because of listening to this misinformation that's out here. Because mm -hmm. they are trying to basically steal your vote any way they can. Mm -hmm. There are extremes on both sides, so you know, try to you know, just just be informed, not 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 to beat a dead horse. Uh, thank you, thank you guys, thank you gentlemen, thank you uh, uh, lovely women queens for allowing this yeah, time yet again. Yeah, thank you, and, queens. And, and, yes. and, 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 and maybe we've been good enough to to warrant another uh, revisit of this uh, men's summit. But um, but until then, uh, uh, have a, a blessed weekend. Um, enjoy these months heading into it best you can this crazy season of everything that's happening um try your best to enjoy it and um and go vote